Um, okay, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Bob Brandom, uh, who, if, if I may borrow the expression, you know, presumably needs no introduction, right? Perhaps you know uh, his masterwork, making it explicit, or you've already had a chance to engage with his latest book, A Spirit of Trust, which uh, I'm sure you know has been spectacularly received. Um, so Professor Brandon will talk to us for about 30 minutes or so um, on self-consciousness and freedom from Kant to Hegel, and then we'll open it up for, for questions. Uh, so over to you, <laughs> Bob. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure. This is just a, 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 an informal uh, talk. Uh, it's a story of how some of the central ideas of German idealism look when they're viewed synoptically, sort of the view from 10,000 feet up. Uh, but I mean it as a reminder of why these admittedly <laughs> difficult writers uh, are worth our trouble as philosophers. So the story starts with Kant, uh, who is to us philosophers, what Swinburne, the poet said the sea was, the great gray mother of us all. Uh, and I wanna start with uh, what I think of as Kant's most basic thought, uh, the axial thought around which everything else that he thinks revolves. And this is the idea of the normativity of intentionality. It's the idea that what distinguishes knowers and agents from merely natural creatures isn't their involvement with or manifestation of some special kind of mind stuff. It's that uh, instead of just responding to things, uh, we make judgments and act intentionally. And judgments and intentional doings are, according to Kant, things we're in a distinctive sense responsible for. They're commitments of ours. They're exercises of our authority. And these notions, responsibility, commitment, authority, these are all normative concepts. Kant, I think, reconceives and redescribes us as creatures who live and move and have their being in a normative space, a space of commitments and responsibilities. And part of what distinguishes discursive commitments is that part of what we're responsible for is having reasons for our judgments, that is our theoretical commitments and reasons for our actions, our practical commitments. So in this normative sense, these are all rational commitments and responsibilities in the sense that we're always liable to demands for our reasons the reasons serving as the norms that justify them. We're not rational in the sense that we always have a good answer to that demand, uh, but it's always appropriate to ask us about our reasons. And this lesson about the essentially normative significance of intentional states, states like belief, desire, and intention, I think was largely lost and had to be rediscovered in the middle of the 20th century by the later Wittgenstein. Here's a characteristic uh, Wittgensteinian anecdote. He says, uh, you're invited over to someone's house and the mother says, uh, look, while I'm busy, uh, teach the children a game. And when she comes back 20 minutes later, everyone's down on their knees, rolling dice for money. Uh, and she says, I didn't mean that kind of game. And Wittgenstein says, and surely she's right. What she says is exactly true. She did not mean that kind of game, but it's not as though she's claiming that the thought consciously went through her mind. Oh, well, don't teach them to gamble. Don't teach them to play craps or even under some more general characterization. Uh, she didn't have to do that for it to be true, true that she didn't mean that kind of game. And Wittgenstein is interested in the question, what is it about uh, her speech act, her request, 
that imposed a norm over the various ways I could respond to it, such that it was not appropriate, according to what she meant, according to the norm she put in place, uh, to teach the children that kind of game, even though it is a game. And it was rediscovered, uh, not from Wittgenstein, that this normativity of intentionality, not from Wittgenstein, but from Kant directly uh, by my hero, Wilfred Sellers. Uh, and I'll talk about him uh, uh, a little bit more in a minute. Now, Kant understands freedom in these normative terms. Uh, one of the potentially puzzling things about his view is he understands freedom itself as a kind of constraint, but a distinctive kind of constraint. It's constrained by norms. Norms are reasons. What one treats or recognizes or acknowledges as reasons for judging and acting. Here I think Kant starts with Rousseau's definition of freedom. Uh, and you know, Kant had a picture of Rousseau over his writing desk. This is why in the social contract, Rousseau says, obedience to a law one lays down for oneself is freedom. And Kant turns that uh, definition of freedom on its head. He turns it into a criterion of demarcation for the normative. For Kant, what distinguishes constraint by norms, responsibilities, commitments, from causal constraint or constraint by mere power is that it's always and everywhere self-constraint. For him, only we can normatively bind ourselves in the sense that only the bindings we impose on ourselves are normative bindings. This is his notion of autonomy, autos, self, nomos, law, being a law unto oneself. And the result is what I think of as the basic Kantian normative status, which is having the authority to make oneself responsible, to commit oneself. And furthermore, it's the authority to make oneself responsible, acknowledging a responsibility, to make oneself responsible by taking oneself to be responsible. For Kant, it's that authority to commit oneself that makes one a person. That's what he calls the dignity of Kantian subjects, which others have a duty, an obligation, a responsibility, a commitment to respect. That is to acknowledge that one has the authority to commit oneself, to lay down a law for oneself. This is a particular version of the idea that norms normative statuses, responsibilities, commitments are instituted by normative attitudes. Uh, this idea that norms are created by human attitudes is a big enlightenment theme. If you think about social contract theories of political obligation, where traditional picture had been that uh, the natural world or the supernatural world came with sort of the great chain of being that was a chain of superiority and subordination. And the Enlightenment idea was no, until we started taking or treating each other as responsible and authority, authoritative, there were no such things as these normative uh, statuses. It's for this reason that Kant makes the uh, pregnant claim that's at the center of German idealism that Consciousness presupposes self-consciousness. And that's because being committed or responsible derives from and depends on taking oneself to be committed or responsible. He says, natural things are bound by rules that don't depend on their attitudes towards the rules, but we're bound by conceptions of rules. It's only insofar as we treat something as a reason as a norm binding on us that it actually is. And here are 
two passages from the young sellers uh, where he's putting this Kantian point in his own terms. Sellers says, to say that man is a rational animal is to say that man is a creature, not of habits, but of rules. When God created Adam, he whispered in his ear, in all contexts of action, you will recognize rules, if only the rule to grope for rules to recognize. When you cease to recognize rules, you will walk on four feet. And he says again, a rule, properly speaking, isn't a rule unless it lives in behavior, rule-regulated behavior, even rule-violating behavior. Linguistically, we always operate within a framework of living rules. To talk about rules is to move outside the talked about rules into another framework of living rules. The snake which sheds one skin lives within another. In attempting to grasp rules as rules from without, we're trying to have our cake and eat it. To describe rules is to describe the skeletons of rules. A rule is lived, not described. End of the quote from Sellers. <clears throat> Again, I want to emphasize the, the Kantian point that the explicit attitude, the self-consciousness about binding oneself by a rule is essential to one's being bound. It's, the attitude is essential to the normative status of being doxastically or practically committed. Now, I think this was a revolutionary constellation of ideas by Kant, uh, but it courts uh, a potential danger of a new post-Cartesian, distinctively Kantian dualism. Uh, there's a danger that instead of a dualism of minds and bodies, we'll have a dualism of facts and norms uh, or of causes and reasons. We've got the space of reasons and the space of causes. Uh, there's a danger of this uh, distinction uh, turning into a dualism. I mean, by a dualism, I mean what happens to a distinction when it's drawn in terms that make the relations between the distinguished items unintelligible. Uh, that, that's when your good, clear distinction has turned into a dualism, when uh, it makes the relations uh, unintelligible. And I think one of the virtues and achievements of Hegel is that he shows us how to avoid that dualism. He, in a broad sense, naturalizes normativity. He brings Kant's notion of normativity, which lived in the noumenal world, in a transcendental picture that was presupposed by our empirical activity. He naturalizes the normativity by socializing it, by seeing the norms as living in social practices. And this is where, uh, by the middle of the 20th century, uh, Wittgenstein would do the same thing. Uh, he, here I see a, a, a real convergence uh, between Wittgenstein and uh, Hegel. Hegel has the crucial idea that norms are social statuses. Normative statuses are social statuses. In a slogan, he looks at Kant and says, all transcendental constitution is social institution. And more specifically, he thinks norms, normative statuses, above all, the normative status of being a normative self or subject, a person, that is someone who has the basic Kantian normative status of having the authority to commit themselves, to make themselves responsible. Uh, all those norms, and in particular that overarching normative status, are instituted for him by attitudes of reciprocal recognition. He thinks to be a normative subject is to be recognized as such by those one recognizes as such. To be responsible, you have to be held responsible by someone. And who, who can hold you responsible? Well, only those who you grant that authority to. Only those whose authority you acknowledge, the authority 
to hold you responsible for the commitments that you undertake. So for Hegel, the authority to commit oneself, to make oneself responsible, the dignity and autonomy that is the basic Kantian normative status depends on its being respected, attributed, recognized by others. Um, that's not just a duty of them, it's constitutive of having that authority. This is a quite distinctive social constellation of authority and responsibility. Uh, I have complete authority over whom I recognize, uh, but then it's not up to me whether they recognize me in turn, whether the virtual community that I institute by recognizing others is actualized by their recognition of me. I mean, I sometimes find it useful to think here of a toy example. Uh, suppose you want to be, you aspire to be self-conscious, to be conscious of yourself as a chess player. Now, it's up to you who you recognize as a chess player in the sense in which you aspire to be one. Maybe you aspire to be a grandmaster or a master or a formidable club player or just a wood pusher. It's entirely up to you where you set uh, the bar. But then it's not up to you whether you really are a good chess player in that sense. That depends on those who you take to be good chess players in whatever sense, that's up to you, recognizing you as being a good chess player in that sense. That's an achievement of genuine self-consciousness. And for Hegel, it doesn't happen between your ears. It happens between us. Uh, you can be unambitious in whom you recognize and then it's easy to get to actualize that self-consciousness or you can be more ambitious. And I think this model applies in more serious cases when one talks about being uh, a good writer, for instance. This is a matter of earning the recognition as a good writer of those one recognizes as good writers. And this goes for the distinctive form of creative nonfiction writing that is philosophy. Uh, what one aims at as a philosopher is to be respected as a philosopher by those one respects uh, as a philosopher. So this is uh, just a, a hint at how he can think of normative statuses as instituted by reciprocal recognition as social statuses. Being able to commit yourself or undertake responsibilities in judgment or intentional action depends not only on you acknowledging the commitment but on your commitment being acknowledged by those whose authority to hold you responsible, to hold you to the commitment, uh, you acknowledge. Your normative status is attitude dependent, but it's not just your attitudes. Now, I said that for Kant, there was a notion of positive freedom as the authority to make yourself responsible to commit yourself, to constrain yourself by norms that provide reasons for your actions, that you acknowledge as reasons for your actions. Hegel expands the domain of the normative, decentering it from individuals uh, and recentering it in the community, the institutions, the recognitive community. His term for all our norm governed doings and the practices and institutions that make them possible and that they make possible is Geist, spirit, but the phenomenology of spirit is a phenomenology of. And crucially, Hegel's model for Geist is language. Sprache is the Dasein of Geist, he says. Language is both the concrete context and the intelligible model of the transformative power of the normative. For language is the paradigmatic case where constraining oneself by norms yields a bonanza of positive expressive freedom. I mean, the norms that we bind ourselves by in speaking a language may be invisible when you're speaking casually in your first language, uh, but if you have to work in a language that isn't your second, you're very much aware of the norms that you're uh, 
confining yourself by, by speaking in this way. And yet the result is, as Chomsky reminds us, this was his overarching insight, that binding yourself by the norms of a natural language gives you the capacity to produce and understand an indefinite number of novel claims, claims that are novel, not just in the sense that you never said them or heard them before, but in the sense that no one in the history of the world has any sentence of sufficient complexity. It's vanishingly unlikely that anyone's ever said before. And for Hegel, this explosion of linguistic expressive freedom afforded by language sets the standard by which all proposed forms of political constraint should be assessed. The question we should ask is, does that proposed political constraint, a loss of negative freedom, a constraint by norms, does it pay for itself a hundred times over the way linguistic norms do? In positive expressive freedom, the freedom to do things that one could otherwise never have so much as contemplated. Language is a social institution that does that. And any political institution that proposes to constrain our freedom, he thinks can only be legitimated by showing a corresponding sort of increase in positive expressive uh, freedom. So there's a word on Hegel on freedom. Let me turn uh, around to him on self-consciousness again. Essentially self-conscious creatures for Hegel are ones such that what they are for themselves, his way of talking about our attitudes, are an essential element of what they are in themselves, their normative statuses. We're essentially self-conscious in that our normative statuses depend on our normative attitudes. What we are in ourselves depends on what we are for ourselves. And that means that we can change what we are in ourselves, what we really are, our normative statuses, by changing our attitudes, by changing what we are for ourselves. So beings like us are subject to a distinctive kind of cascading developmental process, changing what we are for ourselves, our practical self-consciousness, changes what we are in ourselves. Awareness of that change theoretical self-consciousness uh, changes what we are for ourselves, our attitudes, which changes what we are in ourselves, our statuses. At no point, he thinks, do these two coincide. We never are for ourselves just what we are in ourselves. His notion of self-consciousness is not Cartesian transparency. That residual opacity, the difference between the attitudes and the statuses is what drives development. But the result is that essentially self-conscious creatures, free creatures, creatures who live and move and have their being in a recognitively instituted normative space don't have natures, they only have histories. That means that to know what we are, you have to rehearse how we got to be that way. You have to rehearse the process of self-constitution that brought us to this constellation of attitudes and statuses. That's the difference between what's studied by the Naturwissenschaften and what's studied by the Geisteswissenschaften. Naturwissenschaften, the natural sciences, study things like electrons that have natures. The Geisteswissenschaften study things that only have histories. And rehearsing such a process of development, Hegel thinks is a distinctive kind of self-consciousness and self-understanding, what he calls recollection, erinnerung, of which giving a phenomenology is a particularly systematic version. It's recollective rationality, a process of retrospective rational reconstruction that turns a past into a history and thereby makes what happens into something done, something in which we can, we can see normative governance. 
he thinks that sort of retrospective, recollective rationality is the form of reasons march through history. It's the way we geistic beings understand ourselves and so self-consciously constitute ourselves. It's a vision of freedom as self-conscious self-constitution. So this historical dimension is as important as the social uh, dimension for him. Now, in an even slightly more adequate presentation, the next thing I would talk about is how exercises of recollective rationality form historical communities with the reciprocal recognitive structure of authority and responsibility that's distinctive of traditions. Uh, let me just say very briefly about that. Its paradigm, I think, is the institution of common and case law by the application of that very law. The authority of past judges is balanced by the authority of present judges to treat only some prior decisions as precedential and so as authoritative. But the only reason the present judge can give for her decision is the authority uh, of the decisions of prior judges. But the authority of present judges is balanced by the authority of future judges to decide whether those decisions in turn have precedential authority. That is, are suitably responsible to the authority of the past judges. And the only authority anyone's decisions have consists in it being suitably responsible to the law that's instituted by others' application of it. But that's a story for another occasion. What I've been waving my hands at here is an interlocking constellation of big ideas about the intimate relations between normativity, self-consciousness, reason, and freedom, and about the discovery of their essentially social and historical character. What I've been sketching here is I think what Heidegger was talking about when he referred to the dignity and spiritual greatness of German idealism. Okay, that's the overview. Fantastic, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll open it up to uh, questions now. And if uh, we'll, we'll do it by sort of raising the yellow hand, I can see many of you already are familiar with the reaction uh, function. So if you just go down to reactions, you'll find like raised hand like that. That way I know uh, you would like to ask a question. We also sometimes use the, the thumbs up for the follow-up. Uh, yes, the indeed. Instead of the hand, if that's not yes. a process, it's vindicate. Yes, it's a great Australian custom. Um, <laughs> so yes, so, so uh, please use either of those. And um, we have our, our first question uh, from Salom um, Ohini, I hope I'm saying your, your name correctly, Salom. Um, he sent the uh, question to me via the chat, so I'm going to read it to you, uh, uh, Bob. So, um, what does one need besides being part of a recognitive community to have a given normative status? For instance, what if a renegade band of self styled philosophers recognize each other as philosophers, but refuse to recognize anyone who teaches in a university philosophy department as a philosopher. Presumably we'd want to say that they don't count as philosophers just because they mutually recognize each other as such. Uh, so what's missing there? Well, good. I mean, they constitute a real community uh, and how um... You know, I, 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 like my Dr. Fater Rorty, don't think of philosophy as something that has an essence. Uh, I think it has a history. And the, it, it, you know, for a good part of its history, it was not in universities. It, it was sufficiently contested in Kant's time that he wrote, wrote his essay on uh, the conflict of the faculties, making the case that it was still possible even with the corruption of the universities of his time to do philosophy in universities, uh, whereas the French 
You know, Napoleon thought, no, we need new institutions, the, the uh, Ecole Normale uh, Supérieure to, uh, uh, to do this, the Polytechnics. Uh, and you know, the future of philosophy might not be in universities, so who knows about that? Uh, but they make a real community, and uh, it's a difficulty if uh, the institutionally employed philosophers all recognize all and only each other, and the wild-eyed renegade philosophers, the sexy murder poets, recognize each other, whereas the basically pleasant, bland bureaucrats only recognize each other. Then you can have two communities that uh, can't communicate uh, uh, at all. And there isn't gonna be a common subject matter uh, for them. So Rajiv has a, a follow-up. He, he, ind he indicated that through the chat, which you're also welcome to do. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you for that and for the talk. Um, yes, yeah, so, so maybe this is a way of, I don't know if this is what the, um, what the question was trying to get at, um, but, maybe, but maybe here's a way to sort of um, press it in a slightly different way. So I'm thinking, um, well, I'm thinking that it might be nice if not any band of people <laughs> um, uh, count as a sort of community for some reason or other. So I'm thinking that we might want to distinguish between say, uh, I don't know, like, uh, you know, a, a, the practice of philosophy from the, from the practice of um, getting a bunch of assassins together. And, and so I'm thinking that, you know, the assassins might recognize each other in all these different ways um, and may, might even have super sophisticated practices <laughs> um, of like, you know, induction, whatever. Um, there's initiation, whatever. Um, but I'm thinking that the mere fact that they get to recognize each other, hold each other accountable in these ways, um, shouldn't give any of them reasons to do anything. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm sort of thinking if, you know, does, does it, doesn't it take more than just a sort of recognitive structure to be in place for there to get normativity of the ground? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh I mean, Hegel thinks that normativity comes, you know, in, in many flavors, and in particular that there was a huge sea change in the structure of normativity that was uh, the the rolling, still incomplete change from traditional practical conceptions of normativity to modern ones. Uh, the traditional ones that thought of normative statuses as not being responsive to our normative attitudes. Uh, as just being facts that we were obliged to conform our attitudes towards. And he thinks that we can rank them or at least partially order them, uh, these practical conceptions of normativity, uh, according to how uh, self-conscious we are about our normativity. Uh, and he thinks that uh, the maximum level absolute knowing, the maximum uh, level of self-consciousness about uh, normativity is when one makes explicit what one's implicitly committed to in talking at all. Uh, and he finds uh, you know, when in the phenomenology and in the logic he elaborates what those commitments are that he takes to be implicit in giving and asking for reasons uh, at all in talking, in forming determinately contentful intentions or judgments, we'll see that we're implicitly committed to uh, instituting a recognitive community with a certain kind of structure. Um, that, uh, so, so he has astonishingly uh, a semantics with an edifying intent. He thinks if we understand what it is for us to mean something, we'll see that we're called on to be a certain kind of person, to be a certain kind of normative uh, subject. And included in that is things like uh, the warrant that there is for a claim doesn't depend on whose mouth it comes out of. Uh, giving and asking for reasons isn't personal uh, in that way. The assessment of uh, 
uh, someone's entitlement to a commitment that they've had uh, shouldn't turn on anything except the reasons that they can give for it. Uh, what he thinks the philosophers are called on to do is to draw out of us in a sort of Socratic, Mina-like way to make explicit for us uh, the acknowledgement of these implicit commitments, commitments that are implicit in uh, being rational creatures at all in the Kantian sense of uh, creatures that it's always appropriate to uh, challenge their reasons, to, to demand reasons for reasons justifying the commitments they've undertaken. So there are going to be all sorts of wild, pre-modern, unself-conscious communities that manage to institute norms, but uh, uh, where the norms they institute, the recognitive communities they institute are structurally defective. You know, his famous discussion of uh, the dialectic of the master and the slave uh, is supposed to explain uh, the metaphysical defect uh, that there is uh, when uh, normative relations are asymmetric uh, in the way that uh, the superior, the master, uh, understands himself as having authority without correlative responsibility and the slave insofar as he is a slave, the subordinate understands himself as having responsibility without coordinate authority. And that's unstable and ultimately unintelligible. He thinks You're, it's a defective community, a defective structure of normativity. And those are defective persons in it. And he thinks that that metaphysical defect revenges itself on, in particular, the master uh, in the form of the fact that the master is only the master insofar as he's recognized as such by the slave. And yet the master does not recognize the slave as having the authority to institute any status at all. I mean, that's not saying okay, here's a way to solve slavery. This is a diagnosis of uh, what's wrong with it. Okay, so Sophia. Yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was especially interested in the dualism you mentioned um, in Kant between facts and norms that um, you discussed Hegel and Wittgenstein overcame in a certain way. And I understood that as what is like often cashed out as the fact value distinction. And the suggestion was that norms would be reduced to social practices. Um, and so my question is, so would they also become facts in that way? So we are, we're reducing everything to one category, one being either being natural facts or social facts, or yeah, is that the right, right way to think about your suggestion? Okay, no. and. You know, I, I was happy with it until you said reduced to uh, social practices. So, so, I mean, just on the history a little bit, uh, Kant saw, uh, and this was one of, this was sort of what uh, made him feel the affinity with his rationalist predecessors, that we already have to have norms available to us in order to have empirical experience. Uh, we have to be able to apply concepts in judgment and, uh, uh, and in endorsing practical maxims. Uh, so our empirical activity presupposes these norms. Well, where do they come from? Well, you've got to have them before you can have any, uh, any kind of experience. And the neo-Kantians after uh, Hegel, who did not see their affinity with uh, with Hegel, basically their enterprise fell apart, I think because of this dualism. They, they were the ones who saw the, the normativity of intentionality and they could not see how to reconcile that with uh, us as natural beings. Um, now, I think the, the key is in uh, the second of those Sellers passages that I um, uh, recited, uh, 
uh, describing norms is not uh, rulish. You, you've stepped out and are playing a different game if what you're doing is describing the practices of some community as a social fact. Uh, you can do that. Sociology is, uh, you know, can be an empirical uh, science, but uh, discerning the institution of norms in a community is itself taking up a normative status towards it. It is in an extended way treat, teach, treating them as us. Uh, that's part of the uh, universalizing um, uh, implicit commitment that Hegel sees as implicit in uh, talking at all. So he's going to revert to two different attitudes we can have towards things, the things that can't talk that have natures and the things that can talk that have histories. And as long as you are adopting the normative status, attributing authority and responsibility to uh, the community, uh, you're not reducing what they're doing to matter of factual terms. Now, that's how he avoids sort of collapsing into a reductive naturalism. Obviously, there's a job of work to be done to overcome the dualism then. Uh, and that's what the notion of recollective rationality uh, does, as I see it. And I didn't really tell them, it, it, even, I just said there was a story. Joshua. No, uh, Grant, do you, you wanna go? I, I wanna make sure that you have enough time, so. Uh... Sure, very gracious. <laughs> Um, so my question is, I guess, um, it was a wonderful talk, of course, um, but for Kant, you know, you're saying that freedom is a kind of constraint and it's constrained by norms, but it's also not any old norm, right? Kant is seeking in the critique of practical reason an unconditioned norm. And what makes the constraint freeing is the fact that it is unconditioned unless it's freeing from empirical conditions, right? And thus licensing transcendental freedom. But when we naturalize or socialize the picture and the norm that we're subjected to is no longer unconditioned, then how is constraint by norms any longer freeing? Uh, or is there some unconditioned norm in social life, et cetera? Uh, well, very good question. And, and that I think is the irreducible difference between, uh, between Kant and Hegel uh, is that Hegel does give up the idea of uh, uh, norms that are not uh, historically and socially conditioned. And let me say that, you know, the question you, you were asking, uh, you should hear in the background of it, uh, the echo, oh, if God is dead, then does that mean everything is permitted? Uh, if, if we don't have that unconditional uh, source of the normativity. And this in many ways is the problem Wittgenstein wrestles with if, you know, once we've taken on board the idea that every one of the norms implicit in our talk could have been otherwise, if we were differently embodied or if our practice had a different history, it would be different. Though this is not the language he uses, the question he's wrestling with is how can we see them as rationally binding? on us, even these conceptual norms, which articulate what it is for something to be a reason. Uh, and of course he thinks, well, we need a new notion of rationally binding and Wittgenstein's idea, well, we better do, the notion of reason is not gonna help us with that. Let's just talk about conceptual, uh, conceptual normativity uh, uh, here. But Kant uh, had another one of his big ideas was that in addition to the concepts uh, whose expressive job it is to make it possible for us to describe and explain and act intentionally in the empirical world, there are concepts whose distinctive expressive task it is to make explicit features of the framework that makes describing and explaining an intentional action possible. 
And those are on the theoretical side, the categories, the pure concepts of the understanding. And on the practical side, it's these unconditioned uh, concepts whose, uh, that are, are unconditioned because they articulate aspects of the structure, the framework that makes uh, discursiveness possible uh, at all. And he thought that uh, for norms to provide genuine reasons for action, they had to have a distinctive connection to those framework concepts uh, that, that comes out in this unconditioned character. And Hegel just rejects that. Uh, he he uh, is preaching and teaching us uh, insofar as he's successful to uh, move beyond the Kantian categories of Verstand, of understanding, to the new meta categories of Vernunft, uh, a conception of reason that's compatible with the contingency of the contents of every norm. Uh, that's why this process of recollection that rationally reconstructs the history, uh, it does it in a Whiggish way that lets us see it as norm governed. Uh, his, his slogan is it gives contingency the form of necessity. Necessity and con notwendigkeit means according to a rule. And that's why it has the two species, theoretical uh, necessity and practical uh, necessity. But Hegel sees as the challenge of overcoming modernity in the Kantian form to move to uh, a third phase, a postmodern phase, is to uh, reconstrue rationality uh, in a way that's compatible with radical contingency. Uh, whether we've succeeded in that yet, it's still the Hegelian slash Wittgensteinian task. Ron, did you want to respond or, or shall I turn to Joshua? <laughs> I think you get to turn to Joshua, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. I have a clarification. So you mentioned Geist and then the nature of the electrons. And I'm interested what your account is in between these two. Um, so it, it made me think of something in the encyclopedia uh, 1830 ab about the living being the, the 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 animal having some kind of subjectivity or conceptual generality, um, and I'm wondering where animal nature comes into the account. Do you, do you reject it wholesale, or where does it come into the account of normativity as well? No, very good and. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, in, in the current readings of Hegel, uh, Karen Ung's uh, new book is about the importance of the concept of life in Hegel. And it's, wonderful, it's a wonderful uh, book. Uh, but, you know, very quickly, uh, uh, he sees consciousness as rooted in desire in animals and has uh, in, in you know, living sort of mammal type uh, uh, animals and has a fascinating structural uh, uh, account of it uh, that uh, I talk about in uh, chapter eight of um, uh, A Spirit of Trust. Uh, there's this tripartite structure of erectic awareness uh, that we could understand in terms of the relation between hunger, eating, and food. So hunger is a desire. Eating is the activity that it motivates. Uh, and food is the practical significance that you give something if in response to hunger, you 
take it or treat it as food by engaging in that activity, eating. And what makes this, so, so there's a kind of significance that uh, things can have a practical significance of being food or um, you know, a predator, a threat, uh, that something can have in virtue of its relation to uh, a desire, the practical activity that is the expression of the desire, and then this other thing. And his uh, idea is, uh, and this is so much more sophisticated than a uh, stimulus response two-part uh, picture that 20th century uh, behaviorists had. His idea is that the desire sets a normative standard for the correctness of your practically taking or treating something as food. If it's disgusting or it makes you sick or it even just doesn't uh, nourish you, uh, then the fact that it doesn't satisfy the desire is telling you, you got it wrong. You made a mistake. What you practically took or treated as food was not in fact food. And so the, the experience of error, of finding out that things were not in themselves what, you, what they were for you. For you, it was food because you were eating it. But uh, your hunger sets a standard that tells you it was not in itself what it was for you. A distinction between how things are in themselves and how they merely are for you, the experience of error. That's where proto-consciousness comes from for him. So it's an organic, um, you know, an organic basis uh, for it. Now, it doesn't become genuinely normative until your takings matter to me, until I start acknowledging the authority of your responses to things. Uh, and I mean, thereon hangs a tale how we uh, lift ourselves up out of the non-normative, um, merely uh, erectic organic soup into the sunny uh, uh, uplands of the normative. Alexander or James, I'm not sure which which of you is the hand raiser. Hi, Bob, and thanks Hi. for your talk. I wanted to take up this thread that um, in passing you mentioned Rousseau. And I've been reading uh, Rousseau's genealogy of the state. And it seems as if Hegel is also interested in a kind of genealogy. Um, but it's a curious one in that in order for it to be intelligible as a story of how things happened, it has to presuppose, as I understand it, normative capacities. That has something to do with its being recollective, that there is no story about how reason emerges from some genuinely non-normative state. So I wonder, could you say a little bit about whether you, think, whether you read Hegel as providing a historical genealogy? And if so, how is it possible for us to conceive of a community or of an individual that does not have the kind of normative statuses that make meaning and narrative possible, and then a transition into a sort of form of description where we do have those normative tools available. Okay, good. I mean, Hegel thinks that a story about us emerging from this primeval uh, soup of uh, merely natural desiring can't be a history. Uh, it isn't a history uh, uh, unless uh, it's a part of Geist as an always already up and running enterprise. Uh, but he wants to make it intelligible that uh, Geisty creatures, normative creatures, uh, he wants to make it intelligible that we arose from, you know, that we crossed the boundary from uh, non-normative to normative beings. And as I say, I, I find implicit in his story uh, an account of how by socially uh, interacting, uh, my taking your response to something as food as in effect a reason for me to treat it as food, uh, which distances me from, uh, you know, you're the one who's desiring, you're the one who's hungry and so is treating something as food. Uh, but I can sort of file away, oh, well, you know, he takes that uh, to be food. And insofar as I acknowledge that authority, insofar as it matters to me, 
we're beginning the process of uh, my attributing authority uh, to you and sort of getting the normative practices off the ground. But if we talk about you know, the history of institutions or communities or whatever, as a history, uh, it's always of already discursive sort of talking critters. And uh, I mean, I mentioned this historical picture, Reasons March Through History. He, he thinks this distinctive form of rationality that he discovered slash invented uh, is rationally reconstructing the actual uh, uh, past of the community. Let's think of the use of some word uh, in a way that uh, displays it as expressively progressive as the gradual but cumulative unbroken progress of revelation of a rule or a norm that we see as having governed the process implicitly all along. Uh, and that we use to, as a standard for assessing sort of better or worse uses of it. Think about the jurisprudential example at, uh, uh, at common law. But his claim is that this Whiggish uh, reconstruction that explains assuming the way things are for us now is the way they are in themselves, how we found it out. Uh, sort of like old bad histories of science that sort of leave out all the, all the wrong turns. He thinks every such story is in principle fragile and temporary. Uh, it's gonna be broken down. We're gonna find out that by applying those norms correctly, uh, according to the norms that are in them, we always are led to contradictions by our own lights. Uh, he thinks this is sort of baked into the metaphysics uh, of things. So that prospectively, every one of these recollective stories is doomed to dissolve. And his new picture of rationality is this something that in principle, and indeed the determinateness of conceptual norms, and so reasons, is that it's essentially biperspectival. There's a retrospective picture, on, picture of it uh, on which it's cumulative uh, and progressive. And there's a prospective picture on it on which it's uh, a path of despair, uh, on, on which uh, we see the way in which the brute immediacy of the world exceeds any particular conceptualization of it that we have. And his claim is, you know, what, what he's conceptually doing in his, uh, with his philosophical vocabulary is trying to describe a point of view where uh, both of these things are always true. And to, to be determinately contentful is to be always on the way in a, uh, in a process that has this, uh, this distinctive structure. Tremendous. Thank you so much, Professor Brandom. We, we're out of time. Um, so yes, we, we thank our speaker and- um, So much being so little time. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, I, I hope to see many of you um, for Professor Wilson's talk at, um, at five o'clock. I think that's what, what it is on the schedule. So, so see you a bit later and thanks everybody for wonderful questions and, and for being here. Thanks, Professor Brandon. Thank you all. Bye-bye.